Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Uh, if you were here last week, I began preaching a new series and a teaching series entitled Building a Great Life or How to Build a Great Life with God. If you were here last week, I said the first key to building a great life is to let God grow your faith and build your faith. And we looked at the words of Jesus where Jesus said, have faith in God. And the reality of it is every one of us knows that we need to have faith in God, don't we? And if you're like me, I want to know not only how to have faith in God, but I'd love always to know how to have more faith in God. And so last week, we looked at that. If you missed the idea of growing your faith, uh, I looked at six biblical principles and biblical examples of if you want to grow your faith, then do those six things. And so if you missed that, it's now online. You can go view it. Today, I want to talk to you about this subject. If you're going to build a great life, there are going to be seasons where you need a miracle in your life. And so I want to talk to you today about how to prepare for a miracle. There are always times in our lives that we need a miracle. Maybe it's a relationship struggle, or it's a health struggle, or it's a financial struggle, or a vocational struggle. There are always those seasons when you, you get to the end where you say, God, I've done all I can, and it's not working. I need you to perform a miracle in my life. I need you to do this. God, I've done everything I can, and I need you to perform a miracle in my life. And so today in Mark chapter 6, I'm going to look at a miracle that Jesus did. It's really probably the most well-known miracle in all of uh, the New Testament. A lot of people know of of many of the miracles of Jesus, but it's probably the most well-known. As a matter of fact, it's pretty important, I think, even to the New Testament writers and to God, because this miracle is the only miracle that is shared in all four Gospels. This is the only miracle. Jesus performed a lot of miracles, and some of them are, are recounted to us in one gospel. Some are recounted in two. Some are recounted in three. Only this miracle is shared in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's the miracle of Jesus taking the five loaves and two fishes and feeding over 5,000 people. So if the gospel writers thought it was important that they would all share it, And if God thought it was important because he wanted to remind us over it every time we read through the gospel, we need to take note and take heed of it. And at the same time, not only is it probably the most well-known miracle, it's one that speaks specifically to us. If you are ever in a season, or perhaps you are now, that you've done everything you can, and you need God to do a miracle in your life, let's just look at this miracle and see what God has to say to us. Now, In the miracle of feeding the 5,000, if you remember the story, I'm going to read a few verses just to open us up, and then we're just going to walk through the story quickly. Uh, If you remember the story, Jesus was teaching the people, as always Jesus did. He had drawn a crowd. Uh, We're told in Scripture it was over 5,000 people. As the sun begins to go down, the disciples begin to get worried. And what are they worried about? Man, Lord, the people are going to be hungry, and we are not going to be able to feed them, and we're all going to be in trouble, and they're going to be mad at us. Now, I don't know why there wasn't any food. It says they were kind of in a remote area, and the disciples said, send the people away so that they can go into the town. And so I don't know if there wasn't a McDonald's closed, or perhaps it was Sunday and Chick-fil-A was closed. I don't know what it was. But what I do know is this, there wasn't any food for the people to eat, and so the disciples kind of said, Lord, you need to shut it down so the people can go find something to eat. Now, let's read verse 41, which we put it up on the screen for you. Notice what it says. It says, and this is kind of after Jesus had gotten the fish, he said, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven, he, Jesus, gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Notice, Jesus did the miracle, but he did it through his disciples, through his followers, through his people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And, notice this, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. So here's what happened. The disciples said, Lord, send them away. Jesus said, no, you give them something to eat. They said, we don't have enough. He said, well, let's see what we do have. They found five loaf and two fish. They gave them to Jesus. He broke them up. Then he worked right back through the disciples 
to feed the people, and they gathered up more than they had to start with. Now, let me give you a thought. If you want Jesus, or if you want God to do a miracle in your life, let me remind you as you look through the New Testament, all the way through Scripture, actually, let me remind you of why God performs miracles to begin with. Why God performs miracles to begin with. He he does it to demonstrate His power, provide for His people, and to stretch our faith. It's just that simple. Those things he wants to provide for his people. That's the reason. Notice that's one of the reasons that God uh, does a miracle. He wants to provide for his followers. Not only that, he wants to demonstrate his power. Man, that's why we have faith. We want to see God's power work in our lives. But then finally, notice, to stretch our faith. Sometimes God allows us to get in situations, and really oftentimes, uh, He just allows us to get ourselves in situations, that the only thing we can do is look to Him and call out to Him. And God allows that. And then God performs a miracle to show His power over our circumstances and in our lives, to provide for His people, you and me, but then also to stretch our faith. To let us step back and say, the reality of it is, had God not moved in that situation, this would not have happened. So let me give you a couple of ideas if you need a miracle in your life from this passage, how to prepare for a miracle. Here's number one. Please write this down if you have your sermon note insert out. Write, that, write this down. You must admit you have a need. Sometimes that is, that is the first thing you have to acknowledge there is a problem. If you just keep kicking the can down the road and kicking the can down the road and kicking the can down the road and you never come to a place in your life that you acknowledge my marriage is in trouble or my my vocational life is in trouble, financially I'm in trouble or my health is this. Man, at some point, the first step to seeing God do a miracle in your life is to admit you have a need. We pick this thought up in verse 35 as you look at it. Uh, he says, by this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him and says, Lord, this is a remote place, they said to him, and it's already late. Therefore, here's what we want you to do. Jesus, we really think that you need to send the people away. You need to send them away so they can go buy themselves something to eat, so they can go to the surrounding countryside and to the villages and buy themselves something to eat. They finally admitted that they had a need, right? Now, here's the reality. Those disciples had been sitting there for a long, long time. They had been watching this happen. And finally, they came to a place that they had to admit there was a need. These people are about to be hungry, the sun's about to go down, and Lord, we've got a problem. Now, you would say that in this situation, they had a crisis of faith, that they came to a place and they said, Lord, something needs to happen. Something needs to happen. And and let me tell you, that, that may well be where you are in your life. That may be, well be where you are in, in your marriage or in your job or in this or in your finances, that you have to acknowledge, I can't do it without a miracle from God. And that causes a crisis of faith. And you say, you say Pastor, what, what is our natural response? I think our natural response is the same as the disciples. I mean, we operate and live just like they did. The first thought is this. When we have a crisis of faith, oftentimes we procrastinate uh, or we desire to just send the people away. Man, we procrastinate. What do we, we want to kick the can down the road, right? Man, I know I have a need. I know my marriage is struggling. I know this is happening. And instead of acknowledging it, what do we do? We procrastinate. You go look in uh, the dictionary, dictionary uh, dictionary.com, what does that mean? That word procrastinate means to put off something until another time that you know you have to do. The reality of it is, when it comes uh, to your life and your relationships and your finances, the more you put it off, it's not going to change the need that something needs to change. For us as a church... Uh, we've known for 10 years now that we need a chapel. Uh, 
Uh, we've put it off and put it off. We've done other things. We've done churches and ministries and missions and all of that's taken place. And, and the truth is, we could put the chapel off another year and another year, but always knowing we would still need to build a chapel. Why? For the same reasons. So procrastinating is not going to help. What did the disciples do? They knew the sun was going down. Instead of them going and taking care of business, they just waited and waited and waited. And the second idea as you go, look at the two natural responses. Put them up on the screen. The two natural responses. There we go. Uh, we can pass the buck or fo focus on ourselves. And w what do we see in the disciples? They looked at Jesus and passed the buck. They said, Lord, you need to send these people away. And they focused on themselves. What did they say? They said, Lord, how are we going to feed these people? How are we going to feed these people? It would take us more than a half a year's wages. They started saying, man, who, who's going to pay for this? Who's going to feed them? Who's going who's to share with them? What a struggle. They begin to focus and they begin to pass the buck. If you look in the original language, it really means about eight months wages. That's a lot, Right? I don't know about you, but they looked around and they said, Lord, to feed all of these people, it's going to take about eight months' wages. So send them away, pass the buck, or focus on ourselves. And I think it's that last idea. A lot of times when, when we're asked to sacrifice or do something from God, this is really what shows up. We begin to focus on the me, and the me is big, and the me is real. But number one, if you're going to see God do a miracle in your life, it's this. You have to admit there is a need. Here's number two. You must review what you already have. If you want to see God move in your life, you have to review what you already have. If it's your marriage, if it's your life, if it's your relationship, if it's your finances, if it's your job, review what you already have. Man, and, and find the good. Find the good and say, God, I, not everything's terrible. Not everything in my life is terrible. Review it and find the good. Now, in doing that, that's exactly what we saw that, uh, that Jesus challenged and asked the disciples to do. Jesus said, listen, but before you kick the can down the road anymore, before you procrastinate anymore, before you pass the buck anymore, before you send the people away, and before you start just focusing on yourself, man, he, he says, listen, let's just simply review what you already have. Notice we see that in verse 38. Jesus said, how many loaves do we have? He said, go and see. When they found out, they came back and said, Lord, we've got good news and bad news. The good news is we have five loaves and two fish. The bad news is there are 5,000 people to feed, and that's a problem, all right? How many of you know that five loaves and two fish are not going to feed over 5,000 people? It's just not going to happen. And so they reviewed what they had. They said there's good news and bad news. Now, here's the beauty of what we see all the way through God's Word and all the way through the Gospels. Anytime God performs a miracle, there's always two parts. There's always my part, which is always insufficient. And there's God's part, which is always sufficient. And if I'm willing to, as I move forward in God's way, and allow my part to be united with God's part, that's when we see the miracle take place. You remember I told you that this is the only one of Jesus' miracles that is found in all four Gospels. If you want to, just put a note in your margin of your, of your sermon note insert there or somewhere in your app that you can also take notes in the Cottonwood app. If you go read this same passage, the same story of this miracle in John chapter 6, in John's Gospel, there's an important verse in there, a phrase. It says, Jesus asked the disciples this to test them. Now listen to this. It's one thing to test them, but then he said, because he already knew what he was going to do. Isn't that an incredible thought? That anytime God brings us to a season of testing, like, 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 like giving to a chapel or giving uh, to a project or giving to something in missions or doing something, God tests us, but he already knows what he wants to do. And what God always wants to do is to work through your life and my life in a powerful and a real way. And then the question becomes a lot of times from us, 
well, if that's what God wants to do, how come I don't see God moving in my life a lot? Remember, I told you there are two parts to really seeing God move in your life. There's God's part, which we all want, but then there's our part. Both parts go together to allow God to re release His power in us. Here's a third thought, ready? If you need a miracle in your life, is this. You must give what you have to God. It's just that simple. You must give what you have to God. Notice what it says. It says, taking the loaves and the fish and the two fish and looking up into heaven. Now, what they did is they took them and gave them to Jesus. Now, if you know the story, you had all the people out there. Jesus looked at the disciples. He said, you aren't prepared. You don't have the food. He said, go see what you have. Acknowledge there's a need. Go see what you have. They find this boy. Remember the boy? Now, imagine if you're the boy, boy, right? Why wouldn't he have focused on himself? So he's sitting there saying, you know, got 5,000 people here. My mom remembered to pack me a lunch. Now, why should I give my food to someone else, right? Wouldn't that have been my, I don't know about your kids. I guarantee you that would have been what my kids said. Why? Because I eat with them. And how do they eat normally? It's something like this, right? Isn't that kind of way we do it? And imagine what would have been missed out if that boy would have said, no, 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 no. Five loaves and two fish aren't going to make a dent in feeding over 5,000 people. And the truth is, listen to this. And the truth is, five loaves and two fish weren't going to make a dent in feeding 5,000 people, were they? They weren't at all. But my part and God's part equals a miracle. And so this boy took and brought whatever he had, just what little he had, his five loaves and two fish, and he gave them to God. So notice, as we read on, taking the five loaves and the two fish, this is Jesus, and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up into heaven. He thanked God, and he prayed to God. Here's a key thought. Miracles happen when we put what we have in God's hands. Write that down. Miracles happen when we put what we have in God's hands, as long as we hold on to it. If that child, if that boy had held on to the five loaves and two fishes, the miracle wouldn't happen. He wouldn't have been a part of it. We wouldn't have been talking about him today. Had the disciples taken from the child and not passed it along to the Savior, the God, put it in his hands, the miracle would have never happened. Man, miracles happen when we take what we have, our five loaves and two fish, and we put it in God's hands. I love what Scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 17. It says, each of you must bring a gift, a proportion, to the way the Lord has blessed you. Here's the reality. When we look around at our congregation and our people when it comes to a season of giving for a chapel or whatever it is for missions, the gift you bring is in proportion. I love that word, proportion. It's not a flat rate. We don't divide what the chapel costs by the number of people here. We all bring a gift in proportion to how God has blessed us. Some people are going to bring three loaves and one fish. Some people are going to bring five loaves and two fish. Some people are going to bring 5,000 loaves and 200 fish. That's in proportion with how God blessed you. And as we think about it, as we make our journey forward, that's the way God works. But it always takes my part and God's part. But miracles happen when we put what we have in God's hands. Here's the next thought. Miracles happen when we give willingly and cheerfully. Miracles happen when we give willingly and cheerfully. As I was just kind of Googling uh, this idea of cheerful giving and stuff, I, I came across a little ad that you can actually buy. I haven't seen one on a car. Uh, praise the Lord, I've never seen one on cars in our parking lot. But you can actually go and order this bumper sticker. You ready? You might want to go get you one of these. It says, God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll still take it from a grouch. That's pretty funny, right? 
I, I just don't know. Uh, may, maybe after next week, we'll just have Deacon stick those on some cars or something like that. But I've never seen it, but I thought, you know, the reality of it is, miracles happen when we assess what we need, we give what we had to God, and then, man, we are willing to give it cheerfully and willingly. Why? Because I understand that what I give is I'm simply giving back some of what God has already blessed me with in proportion to what I have. I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. He says, each one of you, that's each of you, should give what you have decided in your heart to give. That's why we don't fill out your card for you. This is what you've decided between you and God, what you're going to give in proportion to the way that He has blessed you, not reluctantly or under compulsion. No one forces you to do it. For God loves a cheerful giver. Miracles happen when we give willingly and cheerfully. Here's fourth, and here's the final thought on having a miracle in your life. You must expect God to multiply it. When you give, you may say, these are just my five loaves and two fish. But if that's in proportion to what God has with you, you need to understand that God is going to move in everybody else's life. And He's going to multiply what you give by what everybody else gives. And then we'll see God do some amazing work, perhaps a miracle in our lives, beginning next week as a church. Now notice what Scripture says. It says, they all ate, here was the miracle, and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten were over 5,000. Now, what a beautiful thought. Simply because they were willing to stop procrastinating and stop kicking the can down. They were willing to give what they had to Christ, which was not enough. God then multiplied it through His Son to do what? To encourage so much of a miracle that they were able to gather up more than they had to begin with. And I'll submit to you, I've seen it in my life as, as, as we as a family and we as a church have given above and beyond year after year after year. Here's what happened. As soon as we would do something and give something for God or for a building or for a vision or for a mission or for building a church in Mexico or for building something in Kenya, whatever we've done, and we've given a lot, it's like right after we give, God allows us to gather up more basketfuls of stuff in order to do more for Him. And I can tell you, I've noticed that in my life as well. When I am willing to make a commitment and give what I have to God, it seems like at the end of the day, I turn around and I think I'm giving something away about the, turn around, about the time I turn around and see more basketfuls coming in. And then you get the opportunity to say, that was God and God alone. Now that's individually how I want to see a miracle. But what about in a church? How does God work through the church? In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is talking to that great church in Ephesus. And as he's moving through chapter 3, and by the way, the church in Ephesus was a great church, is a good church, but it wasn't a perfect church. And we're not a perfect church, but we're following God. I love what Paul says. He says, now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, listen to this, all we can ask or imagine. I will guarantee you as a pastor, if you would have asked me 22 years ago when I went to First Baptist Church of Fairview, which is now Cottonwood Creek, if you were to say, Pastor, you just dream and imagine and put the biggest plans possible that you can about what you think God's going to do with the church, I want you to know even my biggest dream, even my best imagination, would not have put us here serving God right here in this way. I will promise you that because God is able to do immeasurably more. And you say, boy, that was just great vision planning and great building, great architecture. Not at all. You want to know how it started off? You want to know what my very first building project was at Old Fairview? to add 34 parking spaces for like $25,000. And I was scared to death we weren't going to make it. And then your next one, and your next one, and here we are with another opportunity. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more 
than we can ask or imagine according, listen to this, to the power that works. What's this word? Say it. Within us. See, this isn't just me and it's not just you, it's us. The power that we're, the church is always about us. Listening to God and letting Him move through us. And this is the power that works. And that word power, by the way, it's the Greek word dunamis. It's the Greek word we get our English word dynamite from. Through the power that works within us to Him, God, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout, listen to this, all generations forever and ever. Amen. All generations. The beauty of building a chapel and covered walkway is whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're single or whether you're married, whatever generation you're in, this project's for you. This project's for you. Some will have kids and grandkids that will be married in that chapel. Some will, uh, will need to see what else God does in that chapel and through that chapel. And we literally can see God bless us throughout all the generations. And it begins next week with commitment cards.